Thank you very much. This is going to be uh, relatively informal. I have a PowerPoint, part of which we'll see. We won't see the whole thing. It would take too long. Uh, and I've got ocean up there, which is all the Baha'is in here know, is a uh, word retrieval uh, um, system for all of the authoritative Baha'i texts, and is very useful. And it will help us uh, not just rely on anything I say, but turn to the writings if need be, uh, to prove that what I'm saying is true, at least in terms of the Baha'i writings. Now, I don't presume that this topic has anything to do by way of uh, refuting other views, or, um, uh, but simply to uh, try to present uh, the Baha'i framework for reality. Now, this is coming from a book I'm working on <clears throat> called, uh, well, let's see, what is it called now? I changed it so many times. Uh, it's called the uh, framework for reality, the Baha'i framework for reality, the coherence of creation. And the title pretty well says everything that we believe, that reality is coherent, uh, and that the Baha'i writings contain a framework in which, or from which, or through which, we can understand the totality of reality. Now, a book has just come out, if you go to the distribution service website, and you will see this book here. I didn't write it. Uh, it's a collection of writings from the Baha'i faith, from the authoritative writings, organized by Bonnie Taylor. I wrote the introduction for, for it which the editors say is challenging, which is their way of saying you probably won't understand it because I should have written, written it a couple of more times. Uh, but uh, the, the title itself is kind of important so far as the Baha'i framework for reality is concerned right off the bat. What do you think the title means? Look at the subtitle and it'll give you a clue. Anybody? Take a it's shot. Of well, that's what the term framework means, but what does one reality mean as opposed to two realities or three realities or dual realities? Yes? Is there no distinction between science and religion? Uh, there's no distinction. Uh, I don't know. Science tends to look at things in a very detailed way, very specific things in creation. And religion tends to look at things from a top-down point of view. So in one sense, they're looking at entirely different things. So a particle physicist who's trying to split uh, a quark, or in this case, come up with the God particle, uh, he's concerned with very small stuff, but he wants to be very accurate, whereas the person of religion says, hooray for you, you found the God particle, or what you think is the God particle, but what does it mean in relation to reality? What this means is simply this. The concept of the harmony of science and religion, as opposed to what we usually say in the Baha'i faith, the unity of science and religion, means that not the people of religion and people of science should get together in a big seminar and say, why can't we just get along? It means that these two branches of human learning are studying different aspects of the same thing. Because reality, if there is a reality, is one thing. It may have different aspects to it. There may be a physical dimension to reality, a metaphysical dimension to reality. But there can't be two realities. You see what I'm saying? Reality is whatever it is. And it may have 50 dimensions. The only two we're familiar with right now are metaphysical and physical. But they're not. So why are science and religion in harmony from the Baha'i point of view? 
because these two branches of human study are studying different facets of one reality. And what we're going to try to discuss tonight is what is the Baha'i framework on how all that fits together? Now, I'm going to skip over this because this is uh, simply saying that we have been created with an inherent desire to learn. The Baha'i writings say that. That we are uh, endowed by God with inherent curiosity about finding out about things, everything, who we are, where we are, and so on. Let's deal with some of the questions that were on the, the flyer, if any of you saw the flyer. Any of you bring it? Yeah. You brought it. Of course you did. All right. Here are some of the questions, and, and you can hit on any one of them you want. How did creation begin? Will creation end? When does human life begin? Will we have individual identity in the afterlife? Will we retain any gender distinction in the afterlife? Is there any rational or systematic explanation for human history? Was there a Big Bang? Is there a God particle? Are there two realities, a metaphysical and a physical one, or are these two dimensions of a single reality? Well, I've kind of given that away. And again, what we're looking for here is not what will necessarily satisfy you in some final way, but so you'll know what do the Baha'i writings say about these. So by the end of tonight, you will have an idea of what the Baha'i framework for the totality of reality is, so you'll know where you fit into that framework. If you do, you know. All right, uh, anybody want to ask a question? And, and we'll, uh, nobody wants to ask a question. Nobody's interested in any of those things. <laughs> I'm, I'm in, incredulous. Come, Ron. Say what? Well, when you, what do you, would just, you want me to just rattle off the answers to these? Well, I'll ask you then. Uh, how did creation begin? Any Baha'i or non-Baha'i tell me. Yes. Tom, say the first. Say the first. <laughs> I, I can answer. Okay. Well, creation has, has always been there and it will always be there. So there is no beginning and there is no end to it. All right. This is what this mechanical genius who <laughs> has said that there is no beginning to creation. All right, uh, how many of you agree with that? You've, you've got less than a tenth of the audience. It, it has no beginning. Yes. Uh, and it has no beginning and has no end. What about those, though, who say that there was a big bang, uh, like Hawking, even though he is uh, uh, deteriorating very rapidly, he's still able to affirm in his famous book, uh, The Beginning of Time or The History of Time, whatever it was, very popular. You cannot explain the point of view without yeah. thinking. All right, so yeah, why, why does he affirmed that time had a beginning. What, on what basis? Does anybody affirm that time had a beginning at a certain point? Alpha Baha'i in his answered questions in that uh, one chapter on cycles. So these cycles have no beginning and no end. They're infinite. Well, he's talking about this earth, though. Hawking is not talking about this earth. He's talking about all of creation. Because Hawking, like other scientists, isn't concerned about metaphysical reality because he doesn't think metaphysical reality is a reality. It's something we talk about, but you can't prove it exists, he says, which is his idea, which is a metaphysical thing, and therefore it doesn't exist. Uh, yes? Where did the origin of all came from? 
All right, that's a problem that you get to after you get to the, the Big Bang. The Big Bang, though, derives from what observation that was made about 40 or 50 years ago? Yes. The universe is expanding, the redshift. They observed that certain galaxies and planets were rapidly going away from us. Now, of course, that's kind of hubristic because it assumes that we're the center of the universe and everything's repelled by us, which we can understand why they might be, given the contemporary political situation. <laughs> but the fact is that if everything's going away, in time, then if we could regress time, then everything must be coming back together. And if you could regress time sufficiently, some 16 and a half billion years, you would come to a point from where it all began. And that, says Hawking and other scientists, was a point where reality began. Now, in what did it begin? Because there had to be space. Or did there? Well, we can discuss this a long time, but we won't. All right, so that's the theory that is current among contemporary science. It's demonstrable. You can prove it. You can see the thing going away. And they had to have some point of beginning, which must have been an incredible event. And they call it the Big Bang. Now, you say in response to that, nonsense, because what? All right, so if, if, we go, if we go to, if any of my programs are still working, uh, if we go to the Big Bang, and here we'll, we'll take us a second to get there, but we will. Here's the idea. That's what it looks like. So if we start here and we go slideshow from this slide, um, a single event that occurred some 16 billion years ago, this Big Bang. Now, as you can see, if you look up here, in you get how all of this happened within nanoseconds, 10 to the 43rd power seconds. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. All right? So Gilbert's question is, what made that happen? And where did the energy come from that release? In other words, if you have, for example, a black hole, which is simply a compression of all kinds of matter with a force that gets so dense that it becomes so attractive that everything gets compressed, 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 compressed. And the theory of the Big Bang is something like that suddenly exploded. So it might be like a heartbeat, kind of, you know. You have the Big Bang, and then in 16 billion years more, you'll have another one, and so on. Now, the, there are a couple of problems with that theory. And I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. It, the theory is obviously observable. It's correct. It's going away, and something had to propel all these things away from us. Uh, so what's the Baha'i theory of creation? Well, as Gilbert said, it's infinite in the beginning and in the future. Infinite in time, infinite in space. And this is something that Abu Baha'i does, as Bill said, say in some answered questions. Know that it is one of the most abstruse spiritual truths that the world of existence, that is to say this endless universe, has no beginning. Now there are a couple of things interesting here. Scientists deny that the universe is infinite. Why? Because they can see the end of it, they think. They can see 16 billion years away. That is, they can see the end of this big bang, or pretty close to it. 
Now, when they get a better telescope, they'll be able to see beyond that, and they can see the Big Bang that's next door. Uh, uh, here's the progression of the framework for reality for our planet. We begin with the ancient Hebrew framework, the idea that we're actually inside the planet which is what I thought when I was a kid. They said, the earth is circular. I said, I can see it is, you know? I can see the sun rising and setting. And I thought, you know, and we're on the ground and, and the sky is above us, you know? So I wasn't so crazy. <clears throat> then Aristotle came up with the concept of the geocentric universe. And then Ptolemy and the Ptolemaic system accounted for, well, if it's, we're in the center, how come Mars at some points is closer and sometimes further away. And how come sometimes it's going backwards, a retrograde motion? And so uh, he figured out there were epicycles. Well, it's still going around the Earth, but it's going around this way. Okay. And so Copernicus came along and he said, what if we just erase all that and start over again and come up with the idea that the sun is the center of the universe? Then we don't have all these convoluted epicycles and everything is simpler. And in science, the correct answer is the simplest answer. All right? And that's called the law of parsimony. Now, that's important as a Baha'i because the simplest answer as to why you and I are here is that there is a cognitive being that made us emerge out of the mud and become cognitive. But we'll get to that some other day. Uh, and then you have Newton's explanation of why this happens, why these planets orbit, and he said, because they're attracted to one another. Why? Because all masses are attracted to one another. That's why you weigh one weight on this planet and much less on the moon proportionate to the moon's mass, because you're not as attractive to the moon. Actually, it's the other way around. The moon is not as attractive to you. And so if you keep going out, you see that the framework for reality, as we learn more, we learn that there's not just our solar system. Here's our solar system. That's us. And notice we're on one arm of one constellation in the galaxy of the Milky Way. All right? And so we see that, geez, there might be not only other solar systems, but you can see all these other solar systems. And how could we not think that out of the millions of billions of solar systems there are in the Milky Way, there couldn't be life emerging there too? Because science says what? How did we come into being, according to science? Huh? E evolved, mutated from other species. And how did we do that? <laughs> That's not what science says. Science says it's an accident. It, it's a... It's, Random chance are survival of the fittest, are because we, ha we got a thumb, uh, and so on. All right, now, we can go back now even further and see that these are clusters of galaxies. So in other words, we've gone from thinking of ourselves as part of one system with us in the center, to one system where we're part of other planets where there may have been life, we're discovering on, on Mercury that possibly there was, all right? And then seeing that, hey, we're part of a big galaxy. And we're trying to understand it from inside it? That's kind of, a, of, kind of uh, prideful, I think, in a way, that we're trying to understand reality from inside it. What if we could step outside it? Well, the, the Hubble telescope is the best we can do right now to step outside it. And we see not only that there are other galaxies, but there are clusters of galaxies, 
thousands of galaxy clusters. So now we go from planetary systems to solar systems to galaxies to galaxy clusters. Where does it all end? Well, that's the point. It doesn't. It doesn't. If space is infinite, that's hard to embrace. Infinity. Infinity. All right? But if you will, in your mind, let us say that we were in a space suit and we were going out 16 billion light years to the end of the Big Bang and we have systems that will allow us to do that now and we're right at the edge of the Big Bang. So in other words, it went all the way out and we are now following it. We're going back in time effectively because as you see it, you're seeing what happened you know, when you see a star light and it's 16 billion light years away, uh, that means it happened 16 billion years ago. And so you, you, uh, you look at it, but now you're out there with me in our two spacesuits. And what's there? Is there nothing there? I mean, if we stick our hand on the other side of it, will I, you know, you see what I'm saying? Is it enclosed in something? In other words, what is science proposing? And, and the answer is, I, I am clueless. Is how could there be an end to, you know, there's a wall there. Well, if there's a wall there, then there's something there. If there's nothing there. And one of the theories is that, well, space expands with this. It creates space, that stretches space. Well, at any rate, as you can see, Science knows a great deal about very particular things, but insofar as the ultimate framework about why we're here or what we're all about, they're not that concerned because they can only during one lifetime afford to become experts in one category. If you're a brain uh, surgeon, you, you might specialize in one lobe of the brain now. Okay? Well, there is infinity, then that would necessarily mean there have to be infinite Big Bangs. Right? How could there not be? All right. The infinite body of the universe, a sprinkling from the unfathomed deep of his sovereign and all-pervasive will, hath out of utter nothingness called into being a creation which is infinite in its range and deathless in its duration. Now, does this mean it doesn't change? No. In the Baha'i writings, the universe is called a, a universal body. It's likened to a body. And so the body has always existed, it always will exist. But the things that nourish the body, such as our planet, comes into being, gives forth life. The life takes a certain form, forms a certain social structure that is ordained, and that is you have the family, the tribe, city, city-state, nation-state. And finally, Baha'u'llah says it is time for us to organize the whole globe. Do we stop there? Why should we? No. Well, the, the point is that that's like a cell in our body coming into being, coming into life, giving nurture to the body, taking nurture from the body, goes out of being, because we know the planet Earth will go out of being in about 4.5 billion years from now. It's inevitable. It has to. And the Baha'i writings say that, yeah, that will happen. This happens all over the place, all right? Yeah, Hardy. Are there alternate universes that are also infinite in range and deathless in duration? You have just contradicted yourself with your question. <laughs> no, I just asked a question. Huh? I just asked a question. But the question itself is contradictory. Think about it. Are there alternate uni? What does uni mean? One. I may be in the common way of time, not the pattern, but I'm trying to step it down for you. <laughs> <laughs> a, a universe, by definition, is a whole uh, creation. Are there alternate places that we cannot physically travel to in this, in this physical, whatever you want to call it? 
You mean, is there human life on other planets? Well, if you're call, what we're commonly calling the universe by definition now is infinite. It just says that is infinite in its range and right, death. Can there be another infinite yeah. universe? What's on the other side of a black hole. The other side, a black hole. Well, with, if a black hole, then what? There's, 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 I don't understand your question. Your other side of a black hole. <laughs> We presume a, a black hole is, is probably circular in so far as its its form is concerned. But uh, are, there other are there other dimensions? The two that we know of, metaphysical and physical. So let's get to the let's get to that. All right, this physical reality we just described, according to the Baha'i writings, is bears what relationship to the spiritual? world or dimension. It is a mirror of it. All right. Let me go through this real quick and we'll get back to this. The Baha'i framework for the twin dimensions of reality, of creation. Physical creation is subordinate to spiritual creation according to the Baha'i writings, and that is, it is a physical representation of spiritual world. Why? So that we can learn about the spiritual world while we're in this world. Why? So we can be, be prepared to cast off this elusive and allusive creation that is our physical body, through which our brain, our, I mean our spirit, operates or associates for a while. Why? All right, all of this is illusory. Well, let's get to all those questions, all right? Know thou that the kingdom is the real world, the kingdom meaning the metaphysical realm, and this nether place is only its shadow stretching out. A shadow hath no life of its own. Its existence is only a fantasy and nothing more, but it is images reflected in water and seeming as pictures to the eye. Now in this statement, what we consider the real world, the physical world, is ephemeral and merely, uh, uh, merely an image of the true reality, in the same way that your body is not you, according to the Baha'i writings, it is a vehicle through which your soul, yourself, can communicate with this illusion. It's like an avatar. It really is, very much like an avatar. So when that association ceases, your soul isn't affected any more than if you put, uh, take a lampshade off of a lamp, the light is, is diminished or goes away. No, the light is more resplendent. Now, so that shows you a relationship in this symbol here. This represents the physical world, this the spiritual world, this is the Holy Spirit descending to the spiritual, the physical world via the intermediaries of the manifestations. Now we'll, we'll, I'll show you that more specifically. Then there's a counterpart relationship, and this is even more uh, appropriate to what Hardy was asking. The spiritual world is like unto the phenomenal world. They are the exact counterpart of each other. Whatever objects appear in this world of existence are the outer pictures of the world of heaven. And purposefully so. In other words, this is a classroom. This is a place to train us. Why not just take us there instead of having us go through this illusion? What value does that have? What value is there that we go through this if we're truly spiritual beings? In other words, the Baha'i writing state that our soul emanates from the world of the spirit, from God, at the time during the process of our conception and associates with the body. It's not in the body. It's not dependent on the body. 
if you are mentally or physically disabled, it doesn't hurt your soul. In fact, it may strengthen your soul because you have to struggle through a defective avatar during this period of your existence. All right? And so when you're released from that association, maybe your will and your spirit and your strength are much stronger for, for having had to endure that excessive uh, uh, willpower to operate in this world in whatever minimal way you might be able to. So the strongest among us who appear to be the strongest among us may in fact not be. It may be those who seem to be the weakest among us. Ultimately, we are the strongest. Okay? So that's where you get this counterpart relationship. So in other words, in the Baha'i writings, on the one hand, you have writings that say this world of dust, that don't become attracted to the things of this world, don't become engulfed in them or immersed in them, all right? to be detached. This is a, a very important attribute in the Baha'i writings, detachment from the things of this world. At the same time, it is also a creation of God and we are to appreciate what it's here for, for our training. So we don't dismiss it, we don't disregard it, we don't disrespect it. That's a good one. This is interesting. Abu Baha says everything that is in the material world is composed, is composite. That's why everything that is material is either in a process of being composed or decomposed. Nothing is in the static condition. And therefore, there can be no God particle, finally. Okay? They think they found it, but they thought they found it when they found the quark, and then they split the quark. They thought they found it when they came up with the atomic theory. All right? thousands of years ago. Therefore, there can be no void. There is no such thing as a void. You can have space where there's no air. You can have space where there's nothing you can see. But there can be no space in this physical world that is not composed of something. This is very important. Therefore, there is an ether. Well, we won't get into that right now, but this is very important because this has to do with an experiment that took place a long time ago, back in the 1800s, called the Michelson-Morley light experiment, where Einstein believed upon finding out the results of the experiment that light is a constant and that nothing can be faster than light. Creation is infinitely large, infinitely small, and infinite in plenitude, meaning you can't stop adding stuff. When does God stop creating? Isn't he tired of it by now? He's been doing it for infinity, for eternity. No God particle, meaning there is no finally, no final particle that cannot be decompose, that cannot be split apart. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, infinitely refined. Let's put it this way. Let's do a little experiment. If you come to me in half measures, you will never get to me. Is that true? Yeah. That's true. You can always divide everything in half. Infinitely. In the same way, if you take one step away, when, how far can you go? Infinite. So in the same way, there can be no particle that is not composed of something. Why? Because by definition, again, I'm not asking you to accept this. I'm saying this is what the Baha'i writings affirm. Okay? Yes, Bill. It's ma masses.
<laughs> yeah. uh, well, the idea actually ultimately originates with the whole concept of the atom, and that is something that is indivisible, something that cannot, you know, uh, and the essential building block of creation. All right, we're getting far away from our subject, so let me, let me do this real quick. And then you can decide, uh, this is how particle physics, you want to know when they first came up with the atom, Democritus 442 before Christ, and then you have uh, the progression of it here. The quark was split in 2004, and then the CERN laboratory thinks they have found it, or at least they found the Higgs boson particle, and they don't call it the God particle. All right, now let me see here. Let's go back. Um, The cause of creation, all of creation, not just metaphysical, but physical, is described and discussed by both Abdu'l-Baha and Baha'u'llah when they discuss the Hadith, the tradition of the hidden treasure. And the hidden treasure says, I was a hidden treasure, this is God speaking, I was a hidden treasure, I wished to be made known, and thus I called creation into being in order that I might be known. From that, you can deduce everything in existence, both metaphysical and physical. Why? Because God is altruistic. That's the nature of God. God is a being of love. And if you are a loving being, what do you want to do? Share your love. But you can't share your love with a rock. What do you have to have in order to have a love relationship? Appreciation, understanding, recognition. By whom? Or what? By another being. Now, uh, your cat loves you, your dog loves you. That's a love relationship, is it? Is it? Is it the same? What's the difference between that relationship and the relationship that I wish to be made known? Does your dog really know you? Does your dog know what you feel and think? It may know your emotions. I know very well that animals can sense your moods and so on. Very well. All right. But can you discuss things with them in depth? No. Well, you can, but they won't answer. All right. <laughs> well, if they do, if they do, then you have another problem altogether. All right. And, and I have names of people you should see. Um, and so, Baha'u'llah restates this tradition in various passages. He says, I love, and again, this is God speaking, O son of man, I love thy creation, hence I created thee. Wherefore do thou love me that I may name thy name and fill thy soul with the spirit of life? O son of man, veiled in my immemorial being, veiled, now, he is veiled from us. God is. We can't just intuit God. We can't see God. We can't touch God. So how, would he, how do we discover God? Well, if we were already in the spiritual world, we would understand that. But God wants something else from us. What does God want for us, from us? How does God bridge that gap between the world of the spirit and the world of humankind, the physical world. All right? To create a love relationship, you need someone who not only loves you, but does so from what motive? Humility. Pardon? Humility. Could be humility. What else? If, I, if you want me to love, if, you, if I want you to love me, what must I do? It has to be a reciprocal relationship. In other words, you have to know me, I have to know you, and we both have to make a choice. And that is we have to decide, I want to love this person. I, 
I not only recognize that this person is lovable, but I recognize that I want to establish a relationship. Well, God has said in these passages, if we believe uh, the writings, that he already has that love for us. That's why he created us. All right? But he also says in another passage, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. What does that mean? Why is that so important? If we do not make ourselves available, then you can't have a reciprocal relationship. In other words, God can be willing to love us all we want. Again, the best analogy I know of is parent-child relationship. You can love your child with all your heart and soul and sacrifice everything and do everything intelligently as you know how as a parent, but you can't make the child love you. It's up to the child to decide. That's about as good an analogy as we're going to get about what this means. It means that God, like a, a, a loving parent, and of course in the Testaments, he's called the Father by Christ. The Father wants to love us unconditionally, as we unconditionally love our children, but unless we make ourselves available and say yes, I want that love and I will reciprocate. Now, how do you instigate a relationship with an unknowable being that is, you can't see, you can't, so you can't touch? How do you start a relationship with this being? And that's what this is all about here. This is the method that God has established for instigating that relationship. He bridges the gap with representatives of himself, pure beings that are what Baha'is called manifestations, what other religions call prophets. And they function to carry out the will of the creator as an intermediary between the two dimensions. Why? Because unlike you and me, they pre-exist in the world of the spirit. They've been there. They know what it's like. All right? But because they want us to love them in the same way we love God, they don't make a show of it. They are not out in big cars with flashy signs and so on. They are humble people because we are supposed to recognize in them divine attributes, and it's not always easy because we are trained to look for different sorts of things. All right? People who are uh, on YouTube a lot, for example. And so the manifestation is pre-incarnate. He appears among us as an ordinary human being. And then afterwards, he is assisting us from the world of the spirit. This is a statement about Baha'u'llah. Shoghi Effendi, the grandson, the great, uh, the great grandson of Baha'u'llah said, not ours the living witnesses of the all subduing potency of his faith to question for a moment, and however dark the misery that enshrouds the world, the ability of Baha'u'llah to forge with the hammer of his will and through the fire of tribulation upon the anvil of this travailing age and in the particular shape his mind has envisioned, these scattered and mutually destructive fragments into which a perverse world has fallen into one single unit, solid and indivisible, able to execute his, execute his design for the children of men. And so it's a beautiful poem, and you can actually diagram it like this, that all the things that seem to be happening seem to be mutually destructive. But somehow this emissary from God, through his own imaginative design of a world order, a world commonwealth, has given a design whereby we can, through the travails of this age that are heating everything up, forge a unity out of chaos.
Well, there's so much more we could talk about and do. So let me just stop at this point. I'll just go through some of these so you can uh, see how this works. That's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descending from the realm of the Spirit through the intermediary of the manifestation, translated into example and language and guidance to us that we might establish a love relationship with God. So why do it this indirectly? Why create a parallel universe, if you will? Why create a parallel reality that mirrors or mimics the spiritual world? To train us. Why train us instead of just making us the way we should be? Because it has no value if we don't participate in it. If we don't do it of our own free will. And so we are, as it were, veiled from the reality that awaits us beyond this world. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. but not the creator. That's a wonderful question, and, and here's the, the answer in the Baha'i writings. That's precisely why these manifestations are the closest to God that we can understand, whether in this life or the next. And so to enter a dialogue, in other words, the way to get to know the creator, if you will, is to have a conversation with the creator. But since the Creator has sent these emissaries who are perfect images of him spiritually, through them we can effectively have that relationship. Let me go to a passage that will perhaps explain it better. The essence of belief in divine unity consisteth in regarding him who is the manifestation of God and who is the invisible, the inaccessible, the unknowable essence as one and the same. By this is meant that whatever pertaineth to the former, all his acts and doings, whatever he ordaineth or forbiddeth, should be considered in all their aspects and under all circumstances and without any reservation as identical with the will of God itself, himself. This is the lofty station, loftiest station to which a true believer in the unity of God can ever hope to attain. Blessed is the man that reacheth this station and is of them that are steadfast in belief. In other words, you are, uh, it is, let me put it this way. When I grew up as a Christian, my relationship with God was through Christ. And the image I thought of when I prayed was that of Christ. He was my access to God in the same way that he says, I am the way and the light. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. And I understood that. Right? When I became a Baha'i, it wasn't so easy for me to simply say, ah, Baha'u'llah is the means by which I can now access God because I didn't know Baha'u'llah. So I had to establish a relationship with Baha'u'llah. And since Baha'u'llah is no longer on this earth, and there are passages I have about how he relates to us, I learned, I established a relationship with him by reading his writings, reading about his life, and praying to God through him or to him. Because he still exists in the world of the Spirit assisting us, as each prophet down through history has assisted his own followers after his departure from this life. Yes, go ahead.
researcher and a scholar, and then believe something that you might just know versus believing because you better know and accepting the world. Yes, this is a, a very important, that's a good question, and that is belief is something accepting that which you cannot prove, a leap of faith, no. And this is a whole part of this that I don't have time to get to. But suffice it to say that the concept of faith in the Baha'i faith is not a leap. It is, and nor is it a point. It is a process. And it is a process that never ends. You never get to a point where you finally understand everything or you're finally secure. There is a stage or stages where Baha'u'llah say you enter the city of certitude. And he says by that is meant that you are secure, that this is the touchstone, that this is the framework through which you now understand reality. So you don't have to, same thing, if you learn your multiplication tables, you don't have to go back every time you have a multiplication problem and relearn them. You have established to your satisfaction that they're true. And on that basis you proceed. The same thing is true with whether you're a Baha'i, a Muslim, a Christian, or so on. Once you have established to your satisfaction that these individuals are who they claim to be, you don't have to go back and reprove it with everything they say. And, and in fact, they become the mizan, the standard by which you balance the rest of So, in other words, when uh, a scientist says, uh, the universe is a closed system, it's not infinite. Well, on the one hand, I can say, that sounds strange. How would he possibly know that? Or, you know, I could question it on a logical basis, but also I could say, well, in the Baha'i writings, it says it's infinite, and I've already proven to my satisfaction that I believe the Baha'i writings. So I'm going to say he's probably wrong, and now let me find out what logical proof would support this. You see what I'm saying? It's sort of like having a head start in the sense that uh, you've been given the framework of reality. So the Baha'i writings say what's going to happen in the, in the near future. The Baha'i writings say exactly what is going to happen, that a world commonwealth be established, will be established. It says how that will happen. It says more or less how it will be formed, and so on. Yeah, go ahead. There is no difference. A true believer is always seeking. The true seeker is described. There's a tablet of the true seeker. Then you really didn't. But then you really didn't believe it, did you? If you accept something because someone else tells you to accept it, then you haven't learned anything. You're right. You only learn something when you learn it for yourself. Otherwise, you're simply parroting someone else's, what someone else thinks they have learned. Okay, a couple of more questions, and then we, I, I, I presume we are, I, I'll go as long as you want, but. Uh, so that's our soul and gender? So that our souls have gender? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, and Christ, believe it or not, Christ, the Sadducees, who loved to throw tricky questions at Christ, that's one of the questions they threw at him. If you have a man, he's married to this woman, and then she dies and he marries another, who will be his wife in heaven? And he said, there will be no, no giving or taking of, of uh, marriages in, in the next world. Why? Because what distinguishes us from one another? Physical, the body. Our souls are not distinguished by gender. So, yeah. 
the Baha'i Rani say, absolutely, we will recognize our friends and not only that, we'll have the privilege of meeting the prophets themselves and entering their presence and so on. Yes? Truth is relative. The Baha'i Rani say, all truth is relative. You will never know all there is to know. You're always in a process. Is that, okay, yes? It never did. We say how. It, well, the how so is. The how, how God could be used. What type of energy could be used? How is it used? It's, it's all, in other words, you've got to embrace the notion of infinity. It has always existed. He's always been doing this. Materiality was never created, it's always been around. It takes different shapes, different forms. It may become energy, energy may become matter. The whole thing is like one body that has always existed, always will. The motive of God, the reason for it, again, physical creation, is to train us. And as I say, if, if we had time, you could really take this one point, the point of God wishing to have a love relationship, everything else follows logically from it. The infinity of the universe as mirroring the spiritual universe everything in creation. That's why one of the most beautiful passages says, you can either induce God from his creation within each uh, uh, rosebud you will find uh, 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 all the wisdom of the world. And so in other words, there are all kinds of passages that say everything mirrors forth the attributes of God. But it's harder to go, that's why it's harder for sciences to induce God, because you're going from the particular, what makes all this make sense? What is the framework that gives all this meaning? Well, from the top down, you can see. You can deduce God, I mean deduce from the concept of God, the meaning and framework of the whole of creation. Or you can induce it, once you know that, how it all go, goes by, okay? Yes? Uh, because we have to use language. So when you say God has made this decision, when did he think it a good idea? If it was a good idea, it was always a good idea. So we understand it in those terms that he, because we're relating to it, to planet Earth, which did have a beginning. And so why did he create Earth? So in other words, we can say particular worlds or parts or glumps of worlds come into being, go out of being. But God has always thought this a good idea. All right, in fact, there is a passage in the Bible writings that, that says, because man is the purpose of God's creation, there never was a time when man did not exist somewhere in the created universe. And obviously it wasn't on this planet because this planet's only four billion years old. Okay, only four billion. But when you're dealing with infinity, that's not much. It's infinitely smaller, as a matter of fact. Why do we refer to him as a we all the time? It's, again, the problem of language. It's the problem of language. It, it's genderless. God is genderless. And we use he as simply because in, in the future we will probably have a language that will be devoid of, that will have some gender neutral term. It's not, it's not an excuse. It's the fact that we have to communicate. Yeah, using the language. It's better than saying... It's, it's, it's better than saying it, because that depersonalizes the being. So basically, we are handicapped by where we are in our own development, but we understand, okay? And that's, and that's what you get from George. Uh, come run.
the, your question is, is what, Kamran? Got the, what he's talking about. There. Kumfa Yakunu. God has but to say be and it is. And the manifestations are the means by which the two parts of be are joined together. So in Farsi, or is that Arabic? Is that Arabic? Or Arabic. All right, in Arabic, be and it is. All right, kum fa yakunu are the two words. In English, we, we join the letters B and E together. And they are the means by which, the manifestation is the means by which the divine wish of B is made manifest in physical forms. Okay, so if you, uh, so the idea is God has but to wish something and it happens. It may not happen instantly or the way you want it to, but it will happen. Yeah. Yes? Uh, if it doesn't have to do with the legal profession. <laughs> okay. So Baha'is believe in life on other planets, right? Absolutely. <laughs> the answer to that is that there is a there is a statement in the writings where Shoghi Effendi says that the planetary let me see for the most just one second and I'll find it for you. Yes. Okay, here's the answer. And this is true not just for this planet, but all planets. The emergence of a world community, the consciousness of world citizenship, the founding of a world civilization and culture, all of which must synchronize with the initial stages in the unfoldment of the golden age of the Baha'i era, should by their very nature be regarded as far as this planetary life is concerned as the furthermost limits in the organization of human society. Though man as an individual will nay must indeed as a result of such a consummation continue indefinitely to progress and develop. So we must presume that this three-stage organization of the community and a central government and an intermediary government is probably, it's the same way as you say, what's the basic building block of society? The family. What's, what's the next building block? The community. And then you can organize communities in all sorts of groups. But basically, the family has always existed. It's just become refined as we've become more knowledgeable about love, parenting, equality of men and women, and so on. So I imagine that on other planets, it would always it would emerge similarly. But that's a guess. That's a guess. But it's a pretty good guess based on that, I think. OK. Yes. So in other words, planetary organization will always assume universal suffrage organized at various strata below that 
and it'll always, in other words, you'll always have a, probably a family unit, a community unit, and maybe something in between. Yeah, Bill. All right, you're right except for the last thing you said. All right, you're right except for the last thing you said. Obviously, once the soul comes into being, it's in being. And as a metaphysical essence, Abdul Baha says, anything that is metaphysical or spiritual never ceases to exist because it cannot decompose because it's not composite. All right? So your soul, once it comes into existence, associates with this body for a while, the body dies, it continues. So all the souls that have ever come into existence exist in the realm of the metaphysic, metaphysical reality. But not those that are going to come into being, because the Baha'i writings also say very explicitly that the human soul does not pre-exist. Right. But that the manifestations do. And so they are a different order of being. They are not ordinary human beings. They appear among us as if they were but the writings say, unlike us, they pre-exist. Okay? My question is, what do you mean by that if the soul continues, then does that mean that the, the Baha'i says that we have some sort of a past life? No, because you only have one life. It begins and it never ends. All right? So, in other words, your growth, your development continues, but you never have a need for another physical life. It's your embryonic beginning and you don't need to revisit it. And in fact, you only need to spend a few minutes here to get the sense of it. Uh, <laughs> and of course, many uh, children who die uh, at, before reaching age of cognition and cognitive capacity don't have the experience. A lot of people are deprived of a useful existence in this life. And the writings say, and they are assisted in other ways. So in other words, this isn't the only way to get started. But if you have the opportunity, it's your obligation to use it for the purpose it was intended for, which is your spiritual education. Right. Anything else? So there must be an infinity of manifestations in the metaphysical world. And indeed, Baha Abdul Baha says that in the tablet of the universe. That's right. They're infinite worlds, therefore there have to be infinite manifestations to teach in those. And again, we have to embrace the concept of infinity. It offends us, it scares us, it frightens us, especially scientists. But learn, learn that it is it's not, uh, when you're talking about your own life, that you're going to live infinitely. You will always be Bill. All right? You always will be. So you can look at it positively, like that gives me infinite chance to learn more and more and more and meet all these other souls and develop without ceasing. Or you could look at it, oh, geez, I'm stuck with myself. Okay. <laughs> so you, we don't believe in reincarnation. Well, We know that they aren't. The, the manifestations uh, is, the writings say that a manifestation has a soul, like you and I do. But the manifestations aren't reincarnations of each other. They are distinct individuals who come into being, who come to this life. As to whether they could ever come again, I, I, I doubt they'd ever really want to. Jeremy. Wonderful question. Uh, because 
they are learning about it themselves. I presume, I, I guess, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. But I pre presume that, the, that they are. You know? in, a, in a sense, they, they might not need it in a way, in the, in, the, in the same way, but I don't know. It's exciting that, not to know, frankly. I'd rather be surprised. But. So, I mean, we really know, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I'll end with this statement. Isn't it incredible that we have all of this brilliant speculation about what the next world is going to be? When we could get in an accident on the way home and we will find out before tomorrow morning more than we ever knew, we will all become experts on the subject. Sooner or later, all right? Yeah. <laughs>